Let me start by saying that I don't want to see anyone banged up. That's not the solution I'm advocating for. Justice shouldn't be about vengeance, nor is it about scapegoating. Let me also state for the record that I'm deeply uncomfortable with the notion of corporate manslaughter charges being levelled against a senior company director who's never actually set foot on the site where a fatal accident occurred. But my personal discomfort doesn't erase a grim reality. Financial penalties we currently impose on employers involved in fatal accidents aren't working. They don't serve as a deterrent. If they did, I wouldn't be sat here discussing this now. Instead, there's a pattern, a post-fatality playbook. I wrote about it not so long ago, and I, I talked about it here on the show, and I'll say it again now. There's a proven, well-trodden path that companies can follow to sidestep the consequences of a fatal accident. A fatality occurs, fines are handed down, and before the ink is dry, these companies find ways to cut and run, often leaving, leaving death, grief, and financial ruin in their wake. So what's next? If financial penalties are insufficient, what other options do we have? Let's start with directorial bans. The idea has merit, of course. If you're at the helm of a company where negligence occurs, perhaps you shouldn't be allowed to remain in a position of authority. But this approach has its complications. For a small construction or demolition firm where the managing director is often seen walking the site, chatting with workers and making decisions on the ground, a directorial ban might seem justifiable. The buck, as they say, stops with them. But scale changes everything. What about larger companies operating dozens of sites across the country? Are we really going to say that a managing director, someone whose duty of care might extend to employing competent people and ensuring systems are in place, should bear ultimate responsibility for every incident? Is it fair to hold them accountable for the mistakes, deliberate or otherwise, of a site manager or a subcontractor they may have never even met? Feels like shaky ground to me. And if we're questioning directorial bans, we need to tread even more carefully when discussing custodial sentences. Now, don't get me wrong, there should be exceptions. If evidence proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that someone, a director, project manager, or a site supervisor willfully cut corners, ignored warnings, or neglected their duty of care, then perhaps prison is appropriate. A deliberate act of negligence that endangers lives deserves the severest consequence. But here's where I find myself conflicted. No one in the demolition or construction industry wakes up today and says, I'm going to put lives at risk. At least I hope they don't. And yet, between 2023 and 2024, 51 construction workers never made it home. They didn't clock off and head home to their families. They didn't get a second chance. They went straight from their work sites to the morgue. 51 lives lost, 51 families shattered, and countless friends and colleagues left to grieve. The human cost is incalculable, but the financial penalties... They're all too easy to calculate, and they're all too easy to sidestep. The current system isn't working. It's as clear as day. So where does that leave us? How do we balance accountability with fairness? For starters, we need to dismantle this idea that responsibility can always de be deflected up the chain of command. Yes, leadership carries weight. Yes, managing directors and operations directors have a duty of care. But accountability must also lie with those directly involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Site managers, project leaders, health and safety officers, all of them play critical roles in preventing accidents. If we only look to penalise those at the top, we risk overlooking those whose actions or inaction had the most immediate impact. That said, we also can't ignore the culture fostered by those at the top. A company's leadership sets the tone for its approach to safety. When deadlines are prioritised over diligence, when budgets trump basic precautions, when workers feel pressured to cut corners to meet unrealistic targets, that's on the leadership. That's where accountability should lie. But accountability isn't just about penalties. It should be about prevention. What if, instead of focusing solely on punishment after the fact, we finally adopted systems that made it impossible for those accidents to happen in the first place? More rigorous training, better oversight, mandatory audits for, well, by independent bodies. They're all proactive steps that could potentially save lives. And let's talk for a moment about whistleblowing. How many workers see 
dangers on their job sites, but stay silent out of fear, fear of retaliation, fear of losing their jobs. We need to create an environment where speaking up isn't just encouraged, it's rewarded. If someone spots a hazard and raises the alarm, they're not a troublemaker, they're a lifesaver. Still, none of this solves the problem entirely. There will always be risks in this industry. That's the nature of construction and demolition. But risk doesn't mean inevitability. The fact that 51 workers lost their lives isn't a tragic twist of fate. It's a sign that we all failed, collectively. We failed to enforce standards. We failed to hold the right people accountable. We failed to prioritise human life over profit. And here's the thing. Every one of those failures is preventable. Maybe that's where the real deterrent lies, not in fines or bans or prison sentences, but in a complete overhaul of how we think about accountability. We need to stop treating fatalities as isolated incidents and start seeing them for what they are, systemic failures. When someone dies on a work site, it's not a freak accident. It's a sign that something went wrong at every level of the chain. I'm just a journalist. I don't have all the answers, but I do know this. The status quo isn't enough. It's not enough for the families left behind, for the co-workers haunted by what they've seen, or for the industry as a whole. We can do better. We must do better. Because at the end of the day, it's not about punishment. It's about prevention. It's about making sure that every worker who clocks in has the choice to clock out again. It's about ensuring that no one else will ever hear the words, there's been an accident, or worse still, someone's been killed. And if we can't do that, then maybe we deserve to feel uncomfortable. Maybe we deserve to ask ourselves the, the hard questions. Maybe it's time to demand more from an industry that claims to have a focus on health and safety.